Warning, we've been making this podcast for seven years, and we wanted to celebrate it by doing something a little bit different, so we invited a panel of some of our favorite guests to discuss May Day, because it's not just the seven-year anniversary of our first episode, it's also the day before International Workers' Day. It was an amazing discussion. We're so excited to share it with you. But before we get started, the very first theme song that was ever recorded for our show, here to kick it off. Happy May Day, everybody. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Seriously Wrong Podcast. Today, we have a very special episode about the legacy and history of International Workers' Day, a.k.a. May Day, May the 1st. In addition to myself and Aaron uh, from Seriously Wrong, we're joined by a panel of wonderful guests, including Liz and Amy, hosts of the Rebel Steps podcast, which is focused on contemporary anarchist organizing and the steps of getting involved in political action. Thanks for being here. We're also joined by Max, the host of the Working People podcast, which highlights the voices of workers to talk about the working class in the modern day. Thanks for being here, Max. And we've also got Franz, frequent collaborator of Seriously Wrong and the host of the Doomer vs. Bloomer podcast, which is a show about the eternal struggle between hope and despair. Uh, Thanks for being here, Franz, as well. So we got this amazing panel here to talk about International Working People's Day, or May Day, the quote-unquote real Labor Day on May 1st. What is your connection to May Day? How do you feel about this wonderful thing? So thanks so much for having us here. Uh, This is Liz from Rebel Steps, and... I am a huge fan of May Day, both for its springy connections and for its political connections. It really feels like it kicks off the protest season up here in New York, and I am really excited to talk about it with y'all. Hi, I'm Amy. I'm also from Rebel Steps. May Day, definitely it's like the beginning. It feels like everyone has who I've been organizing with has sort of been like at home in the cold for the winter, and then May Day happens and everyone's like ready to be out in the streets again. Also, in New York, May Day has, like, a very funny vibe because, like, everyone kind of goes to Union Square, but it's, like, usually run by, like, socialists, and there's this whole, there's always, like, conflicts with anarchists and who's gonna lead the march, and, like, it's kind of, so I, I always kind of, like, think fondly of, like, the kind of silly leftistness of <laughs> May Day in New York. The funny thing that I realized, like, while researching this is that the squabbles between anarchists and socialists uh, at Union Square is a very proud May Day tradition <laughs> that, go- that goes oh, back yes. a century. <laughs> yeah, there's actually, Emma Goldman writes about it in her autobiography about how the anarchists showed up and then the socialists wouldn't give them a stage and it was like this whole big thing. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's like I was le- reading about Alexander Berkman and I was like, man, Berkman could just be a fucking, you know, online <laughs> dude, you know, who showed up to the rally. Anyway, this is Maximilian Alvarez, like Sean said, I'm the host of of Working People and the editor-in-chief at The Real News Network now. Thanks so much for having us, Wrong Boys. It's an honor to be on this panel. You guys know that I love your show, and I think it's a huge inspiration to all of us. And I just wanted to give a big shout-out from all of us to you. Congratulations on seven years of doing incredible work, blazing this trail, and really bringing not only critical analysis but genuine joy and a way to imagine a better and different future to the rest of us i think we're all in your debt for doing that i don't really have a a deep connection to may day honestly for me it felt a lot like when i would learn about my family history right like like i couldn't speak spanish when i was a kid like a lot of chicanos i didn't learn to speak spanish when i was growing up i learned that later and it was when i started learning spanish and i started talking to my families. 
I learned about this history that was always a part of me, but that I never really knew about. I feel the same way. I think I really kicked off when the brilliant writer Rachel Ann Jolie was writing a piece in In These Times a couple years ago. She asked me if I would give a quote for it. That set me off a path to kind of learning more about it. And it really, yeah, had that kind of same excitement about learning about something that I was so indebted to that I didn't even know about before. Awesome. Yeah. Well, and thank you I, and for, for your kind words. And also, yeah, I forgot to mention seven years. This is our seven year anniversary podcast. We have been doing podcasts since 2014, which was a time before socialism had come to America, which was a time <laughs> which was a time when, you know, the primary political struggle was between the blue haired social justice warriors and the <laughs> and the reactionary gamers that was that was the that was the fires from which seriously wrong sprung and uh, i'd like to think that we rose to the changing times as well but yeah i, I appreciate you mentioning that. i completely forgot to mention that in my spiel but yeah seven years uh, holy shit it's been a long time and what a perfect panel for this too because these are all guests that we've had on the show for classic episodes people that we really value the opinions of and who all really connect i think to May Day in, in direct and indirect ways in the way that you do your work through the podcast that you host and stuff like that. I feel like this is just such a great May Day panel. It's also such a great seven years of Seriously Wrong panel. So yeah, thanks for saying that, Max. And thanks to everyone for being here. This is such a great little love fest we got going on here. Very grateful to be on this panel. Sean, I think the Haymarket Martyrs might want to have a word with you about saying 2014 is before socialism in America, <laughs> <laughs> but we can get into that later. For me, what I really love about May Day is, it, I think it's just this perfect like social ecological holiday in the sense that it has this really rich history of being a day to celebrate and commemorate abundance in nature and the coming of spring. I think as both Rebel Steps hosts mentioned, it sort of kicks off protest season in this time where people are coming out of their shells and coming out of their winter hermitness, coming back into the streets, back into social movements. And then there's also this, you know, more recent, more recent as in like 140 years ago, history of May Day as International Workers' Day. And I think there's just really strong connections between workers movements, uh, movements against exploitation and hierarchy and movements celebrating you know, the natural environment. And I'm interested in exploring uh, the connections between those two things. It really connected with me what you're saying, Max, about this sort of feeling of like family history of like, this was the history of me that I didn't know that was me, you know? And when you read this stuff and see the connections between the modern day and these historical fights that we're talking about, it really does feel part of the same, like it's really hard to be like, oh, this is some other group of people. This has nothing to do with me. And to pick up on what you were saying, Franz, about the social and ecological aspects to it, that's another thing that just so deeply resonated with me. There was this quote, one of the books that I looked through for this was called like The True and Wonderful Story of May Day. We'll have a link in the description. But he quotes this essayist, Lee Hunt, talking about May Day in the 19th century, saying, May Day is the union of the two best things in the world, the love of nature and the love of each other. And I thought that was just such a beautiful sentiment. There's a lot to explore there and what this means, but there's these two traditions of May Day, right? There's the labor tradition of strikes, the, the fight for the eight-hour day. And then there's like the older pagan tradition of the spring festival and the, the Maypole. And both of these things, I feel like they become so much stronger together. The union and labor and work day one erupted out of the first one and how the first one was also this sort of movement towards freedom, this idea of taking a day off work and feasting and spending time with each other and doing things you don't usually do. And the Puritan work ethicists, the people who thought that the job of humans on earth was to toil for God until they die, hated May Day so much as this pagan, barbaric ritual of you know, feasting and orgiastic joy. They could hate nothing more than that. You're supposed to be toiling in factories right now. There is this natural urge in us to stop fucking working sometimes and to like hang out with our buds. So there's something very organic about like the May Day spring tradition and then the, the labor tradition that comes out of it. This is something that I read about every May Day now as the leftist internet sphere has their like series of articles and it's like time again. There's so much fascinating connections here. I think this is really a powerful thing that to be proud of on the left and to like embrace and, and push forward. So that's how I feel about this uh, May Day thing. One of my best friends in the world, a Frenchman by the name of Simon, once told me when I was in Paris, he was like, uh, yo dude, uh, do you know why most of French protests take place in spring and summer? I was like, because it, it's nice out? And he was like, 
Bingo. <laughs> so I think like, you're, like you're saying, John, there is there is some deep connection there. It's like as soon as it gets nice out. <laughs> right? That's an experienced organizer. <laughs> I just want to echo. I also really connected with what Max was saying and feeling like doing research for this episode was one of the first times I've really looked into May Day's history and all that. And like having that feeling of discovery that you were describing happening to you a few years ago, I feel like I've been having that over the past couple of days doing some of this research. But yeah, I find the springtime festival analogy part of this really interesting because like I wasn't really thinking about this when I was doing the research, but one of the rabbit holes I fell down was the distinction between May Day and Labor Day. And Labor Day also has roots in like worker events in autumn that has ties to the history of like autumn harvest festivals. And like just thinking of this kind of like connective layer we're talking about here harvest festival is much more about like oh we're done now let's sit back and enjoy this harvest everything's good everything's okay the harvest has come in let's celebrate that whereas like may day is more like looking forward to doing all this work the fact that the one that became the radical day for like pushing for change was the one that's in May, whereas the one that became the sort of more liberal, peaceful, let's accept what we have, it's already good enough, let's sit back, relax, have picnics, enjoy. There's something interesting about that, but I think we should reclaim both of them in the name of social ecological interpretations of worker rights and nature. Let's talk a little bit about the spring festival to start, this history of the Maypole and these pagan traditions and the way that it evolved over time. In the, in the wild and wonderful story of May Day, I don't, I don't remember the exact title. I have the title if you want it. Sure. Yeah, throw it out there for the good people at home. <laughs> the Incomplete, True, and Wonderful History of May Day, and it is by Peter Leinbaugh. For all the reading I did for this episode, this was like the easiest read. And it was just like right to the point, just nailing it right out of the gate for me as a reader. But the thing in particular that stuck out to me was this sort of wildness of the spring made it, the eruption of the end of winter. It's this new sense of freedom almost. It's like we've been limited by our environment and now we have the freedom to go dance and play and feast and not work and all this sort of stuff. Liz, you've done some research on some of the pagan history here. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, sure. I started my research by looking a little bit at ancient Rome. So they had a festival going back to around 240 BC called Floralia, which is about pleasing the goddess Flora into protecting the flowers. So they did this for a while. The note says that it was like probably fruit bearing plants, like looking for a good harvest kind of thing. But then apparently they like stopped celebrating for a while and had a really bad season. So then in 173 BC, they recommitted to the festival of Floralia. And this like usually lasted from about like April 28th through like May 2nd or 3rd. Like it was a multi-day holiday. They had five days of games, of gathering flowers, of like having all sorts of like fun theatrical performances, including one notable one that came up multiple times in my research in 30 AD, the Emperor Galba had a celebration that featured a tightrope walking elephant. I don't know how that works, but I'm very impressed. And I've never seen that in any May Day celebration before. <laughs> so pretty cool. And then also, again, I'm not really sure like where this is coming from, but apparently Floralia had a plebeian nature more than a patrician character. You know, the plebeians were more the working classes. The patricians were the sort of noble people who had inherited the leadership of Rome. So maybe in ancient Rome, this was also a worker's holiday of sorts. <laughs> so that was in Rome, but then maybe even before Rome, like I don't know exactly how far it goes back, but we had Beltana or Beltane in Ireland. And this was celebrated in sort of like things that we might more associate with May Day today. So we have like things like the Maypole, the May Queen who has woken up and decided that it is now time for summer. I think one of the things that I really love about this holiday is that it's actually part of like the pagan wheel of the year. So it's right in between the spring equinox and the summer solstice. So it's at that halfway point. So it's like, okay, we're turning the corner from early spring into like the more summery spring. And then there's one other holiday that I can add really quick, if that's okay. 
<laughs> Walpurgis night is a, another pagan kind of tradition. So this is actually coming from a Saint Walpurga. So it's been Christianized. Before that it was not. And this is mostly in Northern Europe that this is celebrated with big bonfires that are supposed to scare off witches because apparently witches have their Sabbaths on this day. Like I said, it's part of the pagan wheel of the year. But this came up in a bunch of German literature. So in uh, Faust, for example, there's like two different scenes that include Walpurgis night. And then um, also Thomas Mann's The Magic Mountain. I, I only know that book because I'm dating a Germanist, but it's like a very big German book. It's a big deal. There's some Walpurgis stuff going on in there too. So yeah, there's all sorts of like things connected to like fire, the sun coming back, warmth coming. And this has been celebrated maybe going back 6,000 years, according to one article I read. It's not a low key thing. Humans are really into this time of year. Well, with a lot of this stuff, when you look back, we were just recently looking into why the calendar is the way it is. And similarly, it's like you find this place far enough back and it just connects directly to the movement of the sun and the moon. And they were like, this is how we're going to split up our time based on this. And to think that May Day fits in that tradition of like, well, it's actually sort of based on the stars. If you go back far enough, that is a trippy thought. There's another thing I wanted to add to this from the incomplete, true, authentic and wonderful history of May Day by Peter Limbaugh, which I remembered that time. I didn't read. He mentions that in 1550 in London, an act of parliament demanded that Maypoles be destroyed and that the game's be outlawed. And this was based on that sort of Puritan idea that May Day was this corrupting, heathenistic force that was going to prevent people from being good workers. And so they actually made it illegal to walk around with a ribbon and a pole on a certain day. Wild. But the people resisted that in the New World, in the Old, by calling their May Day sports the Robin Hood Games and continuing them. More evidence of the deeply proletarian nature of the celebration of spring of May Day. I mean, even just like at the most elemental level, right? I mean, there's this sense in the moment in time that we find ourselves in where I think, you know, the reductive reading that I've seen occasionally is like people will kind of try to draw a through line between all these respective celebrations of May 1st, right? I mean, like, I think that you have to do some historical acrobatics to make that work. I think what Liz and Amy kind of pointed out is just like, you know, there is something that is present in the most fundamental connection that we have to the world that we live in, right, that feels opened at this moment. So many cultures have so many ways of expressing that at different points in the year. The first thing that came to my mind, you know, going back to my roots, the pyramids at Chichen Itza during the winter equinox, they built this whole damn pyramid and adjusted it to the fucking stars and the sun so that at the same time each year, the sun hits the corner of the pyramid so it looks like a serpent is crawling up the pyramid, right? And and there's a kind of symbolic connection there between the earth, the terrestrial realm, the underworld, and the stars. And I kind of try to think about it in those sorts of terms too, right? It's like in the modern day, we have to kind of re-educate ourselves to be attuned to the environment, to the world that we're a part of because modernity has forced that split that has made us so unfeeling when it comes to the planet, the earth, and the kind of natural cycles of things. That's what capitalism always promised, right? Was that man would have dominion over all seasons, all areas, all whatever. And I really, really like that that we kind of started with that because it's making me think more about how really, in a lot of ways, we don't even have to overthink it. There just is that really intimate connection that working people have always had with the seasons and with the environments they depend on for their living. Yeah, with relearning the like connection with nature thing, I recently like started paying attention to like cycles of the moon, which is like so basic. And I like learned how to like know if it's like waxing or waning. And so now like whenever I'm out in the evening, I'm like, oh, the moon is going to be full in a few days because I can like see this. And I had this moment of being like, how is it that like I've lived on the earth my entire life and I never paid enough attention to know what this thing in the sky was doing all the time? <laughs> We're just so disconnected from nature, mostly due to like capitalism. It's actually a full moon tonight, right? Day of recording. <laughs> it is a full moon tonight. <laughs> like speaking of that history of, of like this process of people becoming disconnected from nature, like going back to what Sean was talking about, about the Puritans actually cracking down on and outlawing this like pagan holiday and this pagan celebration that's happening in 16th century England, which corresponds like geographically and temporally with, you know, the creation of modern day capitalism. And I think 
the outlawing of this holiday is is definitely a part of this process of primitive accumulation, uh, which was this like violent process for creating and maintaining the conditions of capitalism and creating and maintaining a disciplined working class that could show up to a factory and work for eight plus hours a day to produce commodities and produce a profit for the capitalist class. You know, this process of primitive accumulation included the enclosing of the commons, which meant ripping peasants away from the land and the connections they had to the land, included the burning of witches and the outlawing of any celebrations or holidays or beliefs that weren't compatible with you know, a Puritan work ethic and a capitalist or a proletariat, you know, ability to be a productive worker. And so I think, you know, from that moment, if not earlier, we see the roots of May Day as a working class holiday, you know, like since the birth of the working class, like May Day and the outlawing of May Day plays this huge role in the creation of the working class to begin with. So it's really full circle that it comes around to be International Workers' Day. And I love that, yeah, th- these connections we're making between, you know, peasant connection to land and nature and lunar cycles and solar cycles and agricultural <laughs> cycles and the ways in which capitalism like disciplines that out of us and makes us forget that history and disconnects us from those connections that humans have had for so, so long. One sort of funny connection to like land and everything going all the way back to Rome is that apparently the way they funded the games of Floralia is that they took all of the um, fines that they'd accumulated for encroachments on public land and put it into this big like plebeian holiday. So it's just like a really strange connection. But apparently Cicero was involved in one of the plannings of the games and he wrote down that this is how they always funded it. So um, every time somebody would be like, oh, I'm going to just use this public land and close this commons, they'd be like, nope, now you're paying for Flora. Oh, yeah. How do you like that? <laughs> so there you go. It's like the governmental equivalent of a swear jar. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I wanted to mention, doing research on the history of May Day in Canada, one thing I came across was like, regardless of how explicitly connected the birth of May Day as a workers' day was to traditional May Day springtime celebrations. The incorporation of celebration of spring elements into May Day events is something that I saw a few places around, but like one of the most interesting ones is that in 1931 in a small British Columbian town called Natal, BC, a park was temporarily renamed Karl Marx Park for a May Day celebration and people from both Alberta and BC gathered to hear union leader Harvey Murphy, who is like a really influential Canadian communist trade union movement person, speak at this park, Karl Marx Park. And at the same time, they were having like springtime feasts and they erected a large maypole and they were dancing around it and like incorporating a lot of these sort of traditional seasonal celebration elements into it. And I just thought that was a really nice illustration of the way these things have found connections to each other in different ways through the history here. When we think about people's sort of identity as a worker, And there's this sort of, I guess, like seeming contradiction in, you know, the worker holiday, the labor holiday is about not working for once. And like the way that worker identity and worker struggles are often around the struggle to stop working so much. So I just wanted to sort of open the floor to this this idea because it's not really a contradiction. It just has this sort of like superficial trappings of contradiction. What, What is it about worker identity that connects so strongly to not working. It feels to be really deep in the the history of May Day. Work is hard and like (laughs) people want to do less of it, but it's also really necessary to like make all the things in society happen. So it's like, oh, we need all these workers to do these hard things. And I guess we have to pay them to do it. And then the workers are like, you should pay us more and we should work less. I guess the history of that feeling, which would be a very interesting one to tell. And if someone has already told it, then I don't know about it, but I would love to read it. But it kind of goes to what Franz was talking about earlier, right? Is like the history of that feeling of not wanting to work more than you need to cannot be told or understood from a from our vantage point without this story of how we came to stop working to produce what we need 
and produce as much as possible for the sake of profit. That change obviously took many centuries, but you could see kind of the, the seeds of it all over the place, right? One of my favorite quotes that's ever been said on my show uh, was with the great labor organizer in Sioux Falls, Cooper Carraway. And he said, you know, the labor movement didn't just happen when the first group of like amalgamated bricklayers sat down in a, in a hall. Since the moment one person had to serve another to survive, in that moment, the labor movement was born. And it has lived in that kind of relationship by which the physical capacities that we have to perform labor, right, are, you know, exploited, right? That they are driven towards kind of accumulating beyond our needs for the sake of something beyond our needs, right? And, and, and with that comes the type of exhaustion I mean, workers in every era have known exhaustion, but I think there's a different type of exhaustion if you look throughout history of those who were producing for themselves versus those who were being told to produce at the behest of someone above them. So the Haymarket Massacre in 1886, it is a major flashpoint and May Day history, sort of the defining event of the modern May Day narrative, the mythology of May Day. I thought it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about the work conditions in America at that time, when we're talking about these people being pushed to the limit as laborers by bosses above them who are making enormous profits off of them. It was referred to as the Gilded Age, right? Because this was the time when the industrialists were able to be like paying off politicians, making everything work the way that they want, working people to the bone. And so this is following the, in the years after the Civil War in the United States. This is the conditions from which the American labor movement approached the point where we eventually had what became Haymarket. Something I found fascinating about this history was thinking about during the U.S. Civil War, there's this sort of like weaker labor movement than it would come to be in the, the coming decades, fighting in the context of a civil war where their government is at war with another sort of faction of their own government. And they're trying to assert their rights as workers during wartime. They're being treated as traitors. They're being treated as um, that, that basically to assert your rights as a worker in this time is unpatriotic. And there's this sense in the labor movement that if we fight faithfully for the government, we're going to win so much reputation with them that we'll be able to get our demands met, basically. We'll be able to get better work conditions and so on. I mean, maybe just to tease it out for listeners is that the modern May Day, in more ways than one, grew out of labor's demand for an eight-hour day. Right. And this was happening already at the time of the U.S. Civil War. It was something that the First International, of which Marx, you know, was a part, was also kind of focusing on. And Marx himself has a really interesting quote from 1867 that links the demand of the eight hour workday to the cause of the Civil War, which I'll read really quick. So this is from Capital, the chapter on the working day. Marx writes, quote, in the United States of America, any sort of independent labor movement was paralyzed so long as slavery disfigured a part of the republic. Labor with a white skin cannot emancipate itself where labor with a black skin is branded. But out of the death of slavery, a new vigorous life sprang. The first fruit of the Civil War was an agitation for the eight-hour day a movement which ran with express speed from the Atlantic to the Pacific, from New England to California. Now, granted, Marx may have been editorializing a bit, right? <laughs> but, I mean, I think that there is a kind of really interesting connection there, especially when we're talking about that kind of exhaustion of workers when they do not have that kind of unalienated connection to their labor that Marx focused on so much. When you do not perform work to produce what you need, but instead you are just a body that can be used until the point of exhaustion because there's never an end point. Your boss will never have an end point for you. He will always work you until you can produce no longer and then he'll discard you. That's the kind of exhaustion that I was trying to describe. Obviously, the labor, if we can call it that, of slavery is the archetype of that. Right. You know, the archetype of, of exploiting the labor of a human being until there is nothing left. Right. And so I, I think it is important to look at the Civil War in all of its complexities as kind of like a, a generative point that would eventually become the push for the eight hour workday, the Haymarket massacres and so on and so forth. Right. Yeah. And apparently in the lead up to the Civil War, there was a movement for like a 10 hour day and the 10 hour day was the a really common demand in the pre-Civil War period. In the period after the American Civil War, 
technologically speaking, I think it's interesting to think, because often I think of like labor history or like socialist history as this distinct stream from like mainstream history or like the history that you learn in school and stuff. But like this is happening in the time when the, the phone is being invented. You know, this is happening in the time when like the telegraph is a new invention and like steel production is being done in new ways. There's these changes to industrial life. And one of these changes, one of these inventions that has a really big impact is the invention of dynamite. Dynamite puts fear in the hearts of the capitalist class, the owners, because uh, like the guillotine, it becomes a representative to a small group of people. It's sort of an egalitarian weapon as the idea that poor people can produce explosives, which can damage production, can damage people who are rich, who could usually afford to hire armies. So this invention of dynamite becomes really key also to what became the Haymarket event, which of course, sad story in a lot of ways, there was a series of labor agitations around the eight hour day. And so the eight hour day is this big sort of cause celebre, this big cause of, of uh, not just you know the organized labor movement, but working people everywhere. It's a very, very popular sentiment at the time. And it's actually been in law in Illinois, in Chicago, where this happens since 1867, where in 1867, it was pushed forward by both Democrats and Republicans. Labor organizers convinced them to pass it. It was put into law, but then it wasn't actually like exercise in practice. The owners created ways to get around that. They were really focused on this idea of this sacred contract between one individual and another. And like the labor movement wants to interfere with our ability to make contracts with people. And we just want the simple right to make a contract for whatever workday we both freely choose. So like that is their sort of line, right? And they use this line really effectively to convince state and local governments to basically give them free reign to have whatever length of workday they want, as long as they can coerce the workers into signing a contract for it, which obviously they feel like they have to do. And they, if everyone else is doing it, it's your only way to get work. That's what you do. That is like the sort of political context leading up to this Haymarket event is that technically speaking, it is already the law of the land that the workday should be eight hours. It's been implemented in law, but not in practice. That little detail is something that I wasn't aware of, again, until doing research over this last week. It gives this other, this sort of different flavor to it that, that like, with any sort of big political movement is you have these different frontiers moving in different ways. You have people organizing in different fronts in the streets and the boardrooms, the inside, the outside, and they work together in this kind of complementary way. But there's this piece of the story that was missing for me, which is they had won an eight hour workday 20 years earlier doing everything right, doing everything like you're supposed to, lobbying, getting it done. And then in practice, when that actually happened, the business owners and the capitalist class were able to just flex their muscle against the politicians and say like, nah, like we're just gonna make contracts, is that cool? And then the mayor goes to them and is like, well, we need to have some compromise, you guys, you know, like uh, I'm with you in spirit, but you know, we got to meet halfway. We got to have free contracts. I don't know. It just, that was something that captured my imagination because they already won. Like they already, like it was already supposed to be won then when this happened. And like that context just makes it seem so much more brutally disgusting the way that the government cracked down on these, these labor activists and organizers for just calling for their already existing rights to be respected. I think that just really highlights this idea that like equal rights, like this idea that the worker and the capitalist like have this equal right to come to a negotiation and make a contract with each other. Like that exists as this foundation, but there is a huge power imbalance. There's a huge imbalance in the access to resources. Like earlier I was talking about primitive accumulation and how that dispossesses non-owning people, non-capitalists of the means of subsistence, like the means to meet their own needs outside of this wage labor relationship. So when that's your only option, it isn't a true option. You don't actually have the choice, oh, should I take this job or should I not take this job? When how else are you going to earn money to buy food, to pay rent, to meet your basic human needs? This is also really reminding me of like so many classic like union busting lines. So like the line of like, oh, like if you have a union, we won't be able to be flexible to your like individual needs. Like we won't be able to negotiate with you as an individual if you have a union, which of course is obviously like absurd because as a in single employee, you have like no power to actually negotiate on your behalf. And then there's also the union busting technique of like, oh, this just isn't the right time. Like a lot of times like, oh, if a company is not doing well, it's like, oh, like if you unionize now, you're going to kill the whole company. So like talking about like 
the labor movement during the Civil War being like, oh, don't, like, now's not the right time. Like, that's also sort of reminding me of that. So it's amazing how the, like, union busting talking points have been and will be exactly the same forever. And, like, people still fall for them, which is, like, so frustrating. But, yeah, there's just so much education to do around, like, no, the capitalists have been saying this forever and it's still bullshit. And to, like, your point, Sean, about the ways that the capitalist class circumvents the law, right, to kind of brute force whatever the fuck they want into reality. Yeah, this is a proud, long, and horrifying tradition that is very much alive today. Like, there are a number of examples that we cover on working people, but, like, the two that immediately come to mind is, one, in my home state of California during this pandemic, gig companies like Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, and Postmates, they lost, right? They lost with uh, the passing of AB5, a bill that was meant to protect the rights of gig workers against the misclassification that is rampant in the gig industry. In fact, misclassification is the linchpin to the gig economy itself, right? So that you can treat this massive amount of people like workers, but not call them workers and thus not have to pay them or protect them as workers. They're quote unquote independent contractors, but everybody knows that they're workers, right? If you're independent, you can kind of set your own agenda. You decide uh, who you bring onto the work site. You don't get that as a gig worker. This app tells you exactly where to go, exactly what to do. If you don't follow it, you get kicked off. And so anyway, the gig companies lost right? It was enshrined into law that workers were going to be better protected. And what did they do? They launched the most expensive campaign to push a ballot measure through, I think, in U.S. history. They had over $200 million in their war chest to just constantly lie to the public about what Proposition 22 meant and what it would do for workers in California. And they were able to basically, yeah, circumvent kind of the legislative and legal processes that way to enshrine in law a third category of workers who could legally make less than minimum wage, right? And apart from that, think about things like forced arbitration, right? In in basically every kind of uh, job that you start now, you don't think about it when you're signing the papers, but almost every company is going to say, sign away your right to file a class action lawsuit. Right. You know, like if we fuck you over, you are agreeing that you will not take larger action. It will have to go through arbitration. As long as you sign that away, it doesn't matter what the law is. Right. So they're still finding ways to do this. Right. And like we covered in the Winnipeg General Strike episode, they called this sort of thing during the Winnipeg General Strike a slave contract when you sign away your right to organize. Um, In the context of the Haymarket riot, I heard it referred to as a yellow dot contract, I think, which is the same sort of thing where you sign away your right to organize and freely withhold your labor and, you know, that sort of thing. This is a time tested strategy for dealing with working people sticking together, creating enormous, weird legal infrastructure of paperwork and forms where bureaucrats get the option to, where Gavin Newsom gets the option to say, I love rights for workers, but Uber drivers, my friend, they're not workers. It's been going on for a long time, and it speaks to the relevance of this history today. Like when you're looking through this history, there's so many echoes to the present. And another echo that just I thought was sort of humorous was in the 1867 marches for an eight hour day, which was long before the Haymarket strike, uh, around the time that they actually successfully got the law passed, I was reading about the different posters that they were carrying. And one of the posters that they were carrying was like, you know, a fair day's work for a fair day's pay or whatever. And another one is like eight hours for work, eight hours for rest, eight hours for leisure. And another one is like, we obey the law of the country. <laughs> and uh, I just imagine, I can imagine all my friends like freaking out about seeing that in a march, our May Day march, and someone's like, we obey the parliamentary law of Canada, like trying to protect yourself from the police. But can you imagine people flipping out about that shit? I'm sure they did at the time as well. <laughs> <laughs> the more I like read about this history, the more I just realize like how much, I mean, things is very obviously changed in the last 140 years but looking at these like sort of intra anarchist like labor movement like debates that are happening like so much hasn't changed and i think that's part of why this history is so interesting like there's so much to learn especially just in regards to this sort of not contradiction what is the word i'm looking for interplay between what is the law and then what actually gives workers power and what actually helps workers achieve improved conditions and less exploitation and so on. Like it is organized movements. It is being able to come together like as a class, as 
you know, human beings as a group of exploited people and say, no, we're not going to put up with this anymore. And you can create your little bureaucratic workarounds and you can try and force us um, into worse conditions in these various ways. But if we are forming a movement at the end of the day, that's the most powerful thing that they can do. And so it makes a lot of sense that when this movement is getting so strong and is able to push forward these changes, not just through law, but through like actually forcing concessions through direct action, that the repression becomes so intense, that the state repression against the labor movement, against the anarchists, really like boils over. It's interesting, there's like this argument that like Marxist Leninists always make that's like, when have anarchists like ever like actually made the capitalists fear? Like when have they actually threatened the end of capitalism? And obviously capitalism didn't end in the 19th century with this movement and whatnot. And it's, you know, a counterfactual to question whether or not it could have. It's, it's you know, sort of a useless debate. But the truth is, like, the capitalists were afraid, and that is why they cracked down so intensely. That is why, like, dynamite, for example, like, created such a fear. That is why, you know, mass numbers of, numbers of people all coming out in Chicago or wherever to demonstrate and to fight for their rights, like, was actually terrifying for the capitalist class. And that's why we have an eight-hour workday today and so many other labor rights that exist today. Like, I don't know, sometimes I kind of have a double response reading about this history. Like, one, I'm so grateful for the progress that has been made through these social movements, through these labor movements. There's so much we can learn from studying about this history and not have to reinvent the wheel. But it also is like a little bit demoralizing in how much like the labor movement was crushed like after this era and how weak like the modern left seems in comparison Um, And I try not to get stuck in that, like, kind of pity party, like, feeling bad about it. Because when you do read this history, you see how much things can change so rapidly. You know, sometimes these movements really do, within the span of a few years or a decade, really seem to kind of come out of nowhere. And obviously, they're not coming out of nowhere. They're coming out of years of intensifying class conflicts and movement building and organizing and agitating. But sort of on the scale of history, when you're looking at, like, the sequence of events, sometimes like these huge movements do just like erupt out of nowhere and able to push forward these really drastic changes and improvements in the lives of of working and poor people. So I I try to keep that in mind (laughs) when, when thinking about this history. And then also, yeah, just reflecting on this repression and how do we deal with that? And what is that? What can we learn about that moving forward today in social movements and labor organizing and so on? The repression following the Haymarket event, I think, carries a lot of like modern relevance. So there's a lot of stuff you can read about this on the internet. So I'm just going to keep it brief. But you know, this is roughly what happened at Haymarket, which caused all this stuff. On May the third, there was a protest by their striking workers, and they met up with locked out workers from another company. Uh, they were, uh, you know, doing speeches and stuff like that. There were police presence, and they decided basically that this was too radical, and they turned on the protesters and ended up shooting two of them, which created a lot of outrage. This was police aggression against protesters. This is not right. And so people came together the very next day to have another protest at Haymarket Square. At this event, uh, where there'd been a large crowd gathered at one point, although by this point it actually started sort of dwindling, a number of uh, labor organizers, newspaper running anarchists and so on, giving speeches there. The mayor had actually been there and said, this is a peaceful, totally chill protest, don't worry about it. But the police took a different course of action and started to shut it down. And at that point, Someone, and it's still not known to this day who did it, someone threw a lit stick of dynamite at the police and blew two of them up, uh, which caused chaos, obviously. I mean, anytime you see a man explode, it is very unusual. And what happened at that point was the police started firing into the crowd. It was alleged at the time in the newspapers that there was gunshots in all directions and so on. The general consensus that I can see is like most people think the cops mostly shot themselves and that the police were the ones with the guns and people died that day, mostly because the police were firing into the crowd. And it's possible that the police were even the ones that threw the dynamite. Like that, as you said, like we don't know, but I do hear that allegation a lot. I think anarchists at the time were throwing that out of like that might have been an act by the police to as a pretense for this repression and to start open firing and so on. 
Yeah, it was a, it was a common sort of like false flag theory at the time. They didn't have those terms, but the idea is that like a Pinkerton could have wanted to create this sort of chaos and did it. For my reading of the general sort of historical consensus on it, is it doesn't really seem that outrageous that an anarchist would have done it. They were making bombs. They did talk about defending themselves against the capitalist class and stuff. Even in the the court case for the Haymarket Eight, their lawyers conceded that one of them had made dynamite in the event of a large class conflict. Although he insisted that there was not that they didn't think that was happening, basically, and that he had made different types of bombs than the one that were used and stuff. It doesn't seem to me unlikely that someone could have been like, "Yeah, let's throw a bomb at the cops." But it's been a hotly debated thing throughout the history of it and in the immediate aftermath too, the sort of like private security forces Pinkertons was the common thing to sort of point the finger at as dividing the movement. I actually read in there was this 1986 article in the Chicago Tribune where they interviewed the granddaughter of someone who claimed to be the bomber in private. Rudolf Schnaubelt is considered by many to be the bomber. He was interrogated by police and escaped out of the country, ended up living to see the end of his days, not being prosecuted from this. The person that he stayed at the house of when he fleed the police, his granddaughter said that he was the bomber. It doesn't seem like really definitive either way, but my instinct is to say that, yeah, I was probably an anarchist. (laughs) <laughs> because like it's not out of the question yeah i mean like propaganda of the deed was a very common like anarchist tactic in that time period which essentially amounted to like various like political assassinations and attempts to you know rile up mass street demonstrations and riots and whatnot so yeah it's very possible they achieved their goals right they did strike fear into the hearts of the ruling class there were a number of high profile political assassinations including here in the united states right which uh, of of a president uh, what was it mckinley yeah president mckinley yeah so the ruling class has never forgotten that even if we have a lot of our history is the result of the ruling class trying to ensure that it will never be vulnerable to the workers and the radicals in the ways that they were before but just to even zoom out a little bit more, Sean, because I think that your really great breakdown of of the Haymarket affair connecting the thread from the Civil War to here, there was a big lead up to this, to 1886, right? So the antecedent to what would become the American Federation of Labor, I think it was the Federation of Organized Trades and Labor Unions of the United States and Canada. This group proposed that eight hours be the fundamental kind of law of the land of the eight-hour workday, right? And I believe this was proposed in a convention or meeting in 1884, and they said that May Day, 1886, is the day. Like, that is when this becomes law. We build up to that if anyone, you know, like, we, we strike if we need to. And so there was, I think, two years there where... You had a lot of strikes across the United States, especially compared to the previous years, right? There there was a lot of labor activity, not just in Chicago, although Chicago was kind of the epicenter of a lot of it. In New York, you had Pittsburgh, but there was a lot of labor strife in these years leading up to the kind of culminating event in 1886. And I think one thing to kind of underscore there, since we were just talking about the ways capitalists and the ruling class weaponize the law, right? to bind those whom the law does not represent for the purposes of those whom the law represents but does not bind. You look at today, the very notion that we could create the kind of environment that workers created between 1884 and 1886 is illegal. You cannot have these sympathy strikes and other interconnected strikes being launched and being coordinated in this way, right? In in the United States, that is illegal. In a way, that's kind of the product of Samuel Gompers' vision. You know, I know a lot of people talk about him as the kind of tentpole of business unionism, but more than anything, he is kind of the archetype of the liberal synthesis of labor peace. But we won't get into that just yet. The point being is that that tumult, that labor tumult that was created in this years is actually something that the ruling class has tried to write out of a legal possibility in the years that came after Haymarket. But anyway, you had this labor strife. And just to really boil it down and synthesize it for folks, I mentioned this great article in In These Times by Rachel Angelie. Just a quick thing that she says is, quote, May Day was born in Chicago in 1886. During the late 19th century, workers tired of 10 to 16 hour days and little pay began to organize along socialist and anarchist principles. 
whether in formal unions, political parties, or cultural groups, working class people in the United States were motivated by their dismal conditions and the hope they found in anti-capitalist ideas. With discussions about unfair working conditions spreading like a fever, the 1884 Convention of the Federation of Organized Trades and Labor Unions concluded with a declaration that, quote, eight hours shall constitute a legal day's labor from and after May 1st, 1886, end quote. Both the FOTLU and the Knights of Labor would support strikes and demonstrations to achieve it. When May 1st finally arrived, 40,000 workers went on strike in Chicago, and over 300,000 workers across the United States walked off their jobs. For two days, rallies and demonstrations ensued without violence, but on May 3rd, police attacked and killed picketing workers at the McCormick Reaper Works plant in Chicago. Labor leaders called for a public meeting to protest the deaths set for the evening of May 4th in Haymarket Square. And then we get into the events that, that Sean was saying. A bomb exploded. People were killed. Shots were fired. And this resulted in the kind of swift and unjust execution of Adolf Fisher, George Engel, Albert Parsons, and August Spees in 1887, November 11th. One piece of context for this, like, gaining steam into 1886 I read in a pamphlet on the history of May Day that actually strike activity increased twofold between 1885 and 1886. Like it completely doubled. So there's like records of about 250,000 people participating in strikes in 1885. And then by the time we get to 1886, it's like over 600,000 apparently were participating in the strike for the eight hour workday. So also just thinking of like what it looks like for us to like double our, our efforts. That's like a lot to think about, but that's what they did leading up to this moment. So there's like a, there's a really tangible way to like look at this like increasing agitation agitation over just the course of a year between when it was declared that they were going to do the eight hour workday and all this in 1884 leading up to 1886. I guess you can double the amount by just bringing one friend next time, right? That's the, the organizing <laughs> trick. When it comes to the people who were put to trial and the trial that they faced, they faced an unjust, biased business class trial that from the start set out to kill them. Not to have any sort of like fair trial, not to even be like, are these guys responsible for the bomb? It was accepted that none of these guys were responsible for the bomb. And it was accepted that basically we're going to put them on trial for being open socialists and anarchists and labor organizers in a society that doesn't want to appreciate or support that existing. Even from the start, and there's, there's really damning and messed up quotes from the people who were involved in this saying basically like the head of the police force or said like you know arrest them first and look at the law later you know and the guy who was running the trial was like i'm here to kill these guys you know like there's quotes as explicit as that that exist from the time and it had popular support People were terrified of this idea of these foreign invaders, these bomb throwing anarchists who want to overthrow the system. The reason for that fear is, I mean, we can blame that a lot on the media apparatus they have and the, the opinion pieces or the news, the opinion masquerading as news and all this through the mainstream media. But it's also contextually in Chicago, there had been the sort of like great Chicago fire. And that captured the imagination of people in Chicago as being potentially connected to anarchist foreign dissidents trying to burn down our system and part of the reason that connected for them is because of the fires of the paris commune which you know reached their reached the knowledge base in chicago through international press that first of all you know the paris commune being set up in the desperation of defending the paris commune there were fires set and so even though there wasn't really a basis to say this was an anarchist fire the, the great fire of chicago or anything like that it was something that percolated in the public imagination as a possibility the actual fire was typically blamed on a i think it was like a poor german woman accidentally kicking over a lantern or something was like the classical myth of it which again it's like it's not explicit in saying oh this was an anarchist fire but it was kind kind of like a dog whistle to the idea of these like foreign radicals who don't really have alliance to America started this fire. So there's a lot of like popular sentiment against anarchist violence at the time of the Haymarket massacre. And they were really successful in their case to just 
have a show trial and kill innocent people, basically. And that that's something that's really depressing and sad about this case is to watch and to read about and think about what it would be like to go through this as a defendee, as, a, as someone just witnessing this happening, who cares about these things. There's a silver lining of something that I think is really beautiful here. And it's what the people who were set to death actually said in their last times on Earth. And this is some of the most beautiful and touching quotes. George Engel, when he's hanged, he was a socialist. His last words were, hooray for anarchy. Albert Parsons said in the newspaper that he wrote for, it's this uh, German language anarchist communist sort of newspaper, he wrote in it, from death row, now I say to all, falter not, lay bare the inequalities of capitalism, expose the slavery of law, proclaim the tyranny of government, denounce the greed, cruelty, abominations of the privileged classes who ride and revel in the labor of the wage slaves. August Spies said, the day will come when our silence will be more powerful than the voices you strangle today. And that's the classic one, it's on the Heyday Martyrs Monument. And by God, he was, he was right. He, he was really right. And within 10 years, the sentiment inverted and people saw what happened to these people and saw that they were innocent and saw that they were unrepentant to the end saying, I'm innocent. Strike me down. I'll become more popular. <laughs> I'll become more powerful than you can imagine. May the fourth be with you. The governor pardoned some of them and would have pardoned more if they had asked for it, but some refused to ask for it on the principle. One of them committed suicide in prison as an act of defiance in that instance. Apparently, he could have written to the governor and gotten pardoned, but said basically like, no, fuck you. I'm a martyr. That human spirit, you're about to kill me for reasons that don't make sense. And it's nakedly obvious that you're the monster here. And, I, and, and I'm the victim and I'll face death. I'm going to not bend. I'm going to face death with that being what happened here, and then you will bear the fruit of the seeds you planted. And they were right. And I think that's like the beautiful and inspiring thing. The massacre isn't just a sad day of labor history. We say, oh, they repressed us, they harmed us, they got away with it. It's this moment of defiance where they didn't get away with it, and we stood together, and we fought over the years, and then we won the narrative. That part of it is not so sad to me. People died so defiant. I find it very inspiring. You said their voices would go on, right? And so one of the most famous anarchists, Emma Goldman, like she was alive and becoming political like during this time and was reading and following all of the different parts of the Haymarket affair. And then finally, you know, the ones that were convicted were hung and and this was like so meaningful to her, just like so emotional for her that she was like, I'm going to dedicate my life to the memory of these martyrs. And like, now I'm going to go to New York. And she becomes obviously this very well-known political person. And that's all I like to think of, like, you know, we have these moments now with like, you know, things like Occupy Wall Street or Trump's election or, you know, the George Floyd rebellion, where we have these swells of new people becoming political. And I think it's like fun for me to think back and be like, oh, that was another moment. Like the Haymarket affair was like a moment where like there was a new groundswell of people like becoming political. Like there's always those moments. And like this was a really big one in the past. It makes me think when the half million people struck before this, do you guys think that they were all like good enough? Do you think they really got it? Or were they sort of like, <laughs> like, the, like, I'm just kidding. But I mean, that's how people sort of talk about it now. But like, you They're have probably those problematic. <laughs> At least one of them was problematic. At least one. <laughs> At least one. Yeah, I'm not sure they were striking for the right reasons. <laughs> If Twitter existed, a couple of them could have gotten canceled. I mean, they if they were smart, they would realize that it's actually a privilege to go on strike. Wasn't that, wasn't that a thing? Do, oh, wasn't yeah. People saying that like a year ago? Yeah. <laughs> well, I really do. You can really um, put social justice terms in any sentence now. It's amazing. You can, yeah. <laughs> and I really love the way that, that you put it, Sean, because, I mean, it kind of brings us back to where we were starting, right? We were talking about the roots of May Day in the most elemental connection that we as human beings have to the world of which we're a part right and and in that same way like you're saying whether it be Haymarket, whether it be the rainbow coalition i mean jesus rick santorum was just on tv this week talking about how nothing was in the united states before the settlers got here he's like oh there may have been some native america i mean just the complete erasure of a certain like human imprint on history thinking about it in those terms especially when we talked about how the kind of lead up to the Haymarket affair was, you know, a movement based on asserting the right to an eight hour workday. Why? Because we're human beings and we were not meant to work more than that. Right. Why? Because to be on this earth is to be more than just a body ground up in the gears of a machine for the profit of another. Right. There is something just so fundamental about what it means to be on this earth, what it means to be a human being 
you you see the forces that would take that away, that would stamp that out, that would erase that from the ledger of human history. And they, they couldn't, right? Because people stood up and embodied that alternative way of understanding what it means to be human and refused to comply with the other kind of definition of what humanity is and what society is and what modernity means right even if you get run over by that machine your imprint is left to remind people that it doesn't have to be this way that there are and always have been other people who have recognized the injustice of this sort of system and i think that it's really important to see ourselves as part of that legacy because it continues right just like cooper caraway was saying right that struggle will never end and it's important to always kind of be and bear witness to the inhumanity uh, that we want to resist. And in that spirit, uh, Lewis Ling, uh, the, the only one of the Haymarket martyrs who actually made bombs, they found bomb <laughs> materials at his house, but he, it didn't seem like he actually made the bomb or threw the bomb there. It was actually accepted that he didn't. He said, when you shall have hanged us, they will do the bomb throwing. In this, I hope to say to you, I despise you. I despise your order, your laws, your force propped authority. Hang me for it. Even in this kind of forge of the mid-1880s, there were parts of the labor movement such that it was that really kind of went around, right, this problem, right, this problem of an imposed order. There were those, as we've been talking about, who were more on one side, which was predominantly the socialists, the anarchists. They were heavily made up of more immigrant populations from Eastern and Southern Europe. The more anarchist side really kind of breathed a lot of life into, say, the industrial workers of the world, the IWW, which was very internationalist and focused, heavily influenced by anarchism. You had the Socialist Party that was still more radical, that drew a lot of kind of radical lessons from Marx and the First International, parts from Russia and Eastern Europe. The anarchists and socialists, obviously, they had a lot of disagreements, but what bound them together was that their view of labor politics, of the necessary fight and future of the working class, was fundamentally fused to a systemic critique of capitalist modernity, a recognition that this system needed to be overthrown. It was unjust. It was always going to exploit the workers for the sake of the bosses, and there was no way to repair it. You had to undo it. And then you had the other, the more straight and narrow, Samuel Gompers-led side of the labor movement that would become enshrined in the American Federation of Labor. Kind of liberal synthesis notion that, well, in fact, if workers just focus on the shop floor and not think about all these other systemic societal critique things, but if we just stay in our lane and focus on what we need to get out of a contract with the bosses, then actually everything else is going to be gravy, right? So these were kind of, I think, the paths that were already intermingling at this time, but I think after Haymarket, they really started going in different directions. Just like we were saying, with people witnessing, whether it be the Great Fire of 1871, whether it be the Haymarket massacres, right, whether it be the high-stakes political assassinations in the coming years, there was this fear that society could unfold. There was, I think, a real desire to believe that society's problems could be fixed in an amicable way and that we basically had the gist of it, right? We just needed to kind of balance it out. That's what Samuel Gompers represented. Right. He represented a more homegrown, very white, you know, male kind of side of the labor movement that said, as long as people are as workers are organized, then we're going to be fine. We're going to achieve a state of labor peace. The bosses and the workers are going to kind of be at an equilibrium. Society is going to be perfected and we're going to be great. Now, Gompers was also, you know, like a virulent anti-radical critic who would end up kind of throwing socialists and anarchists under the bus, especially in, in the red, first Red Scare during World War I, where the American Federation of Labor was essentially promised a bigger seat at the bargaining table during wartime production if they disavowed any socialist or anarchist kind of leanings, committed to the war effort, committed to nationalism, so on and so forth, right? And so I just wanted to highlight that after the furnace of the mid-1880s, culminating in the Haymarket affair, you really started to see these two paths diverging after that, paths that start driving us towards the 20th century. 
Well, so at the Second International in Paris in 1889, Marxists and social democrats from various governments and various organizations around the world together came and they said, you know, May Day is going to be our day, the, the workers' day to commemorate the May Day martyrs and continue the fight for the eight-hour day. It's very similar to what you're talking about, Max, with that devil's bargain and what ended up happening with the Second International and falling apart over the issue of war and peace. So one of the other things they declared in 1889 was uh, one of their demands was basically world peace. Uh, they didn't use that term, but they wanted to dissolve militaries into citizens' militias and end uh, militarism and war abroad. It's always been a contentious issue within socialism because it's a very, very complex topic. It doesn't play well to simple ideas when you're talking about war and militarism in an international context. But this was one of the things that they came out with in the Paris 1889 resolutions. But what happened with the Second International eventually is that the social democratic parties who were allied through this thing, they were allied with each other in the cause of international socialism, faced devil's bargains in their own countries during World War I, which is that they could be integrated within their own local political systems if they took the nationalist route and supported the war. If they took the internationalist anti-war route, it was going to cause them trouble in their own countries to be treated as radical outsiders. And basically all of these parties took that devil's bargain in the same way and fractured international socialism in favor of variations of instead national socialisms. So that's like the fracturing of the Second International, which I also feel like is an echo of the Civil War period and how the labor movement was undermined by being in wartime. And that there's this reoccurring sort of thing you can see where international wars and the threat of outsiders is used as a way to undermine the ideas of socialism, egalitarianism, and so on. I find that history really fascinating and, and troubling um, in a way as well. And this brings us to the big split, the two May Days, the two Labor Days that we talked about earlier, beginning of the show, is relation to spring and fall. But strangely enough, for some reason, America and Canada and almost nowhere else places Labor Day in fall instead of spring. I wanted to ask, why is that? Why doesn't America just celebrate good old May Day? Why doesn't Canada just celebrate good old May Day? Yeah, it's funny. The reason I went down this rabbit hole in studying this was that I was just kind of looking at Canadian May Day history. And like after the Second International kind of declared, you know, we should celebrate May Day, continue this fight. The first major May Day events in Canada were in Montreal in 1906. They were like really well attended. There's lots of different labor groups, women's groups, lots of immigrant groups, lots of speeches in different languages. Given at this event, it was a real like international workers solidarity event. Then the very next year in Montreal in 1907, they try to do it again. And there is a lot more police repression of the event. And a lot of trade and labor unions were not showing solidarity with the May Day events. Specifically, the Montreal Trade and Labor Council issued a statement saying that it did not share the socialist principles of the organizers of the May Day events, but that it recognized no other Labor Day than the one celebrated on the first Monday in September. Then I went to look at like, well, when did Canada initiate Labor Day? Like, when did that become a thing? This is 1907. May Day's taking off. When was Labor Day instituted? And it's like, oh, it was in 1904. And why did Canada do that? They did it because America did it in the same year, the most Canadian thing ever. They're just like, oh, yeah, America did it. So let's uh, also pass the law. So then I decided to look into why America created an official holiday of Labor Day the first Monday of September. There was a lot of currents that I saw contributing to it, but the part of it that really captured my imagination was this story of the Pullman strike, a national railroad strike that escalated over the course of a few months and eventually they had to call in the military. And like it was a big conflict between workers and the state. But the funniest thing about the Pullman strike is that it starts in the company town of Pullman, Chicago, which was designed as a model community by George Pullman, the head of the Pullman company. And almost everybody in the town worked at the factory building Pullman train cars. The town is named after his last name, and it's the same name as the company. And they all work at his factory. It's just like his 
city. It, it gets even darker than that, man. So like I got really into the Pullman town back as a like young grad student. You know, recently I was like very invested in covering the Amazon Union Drive in Bessemer, Alabama. Right. I went down there. I interviewed a number of the workers and organizers there for working people and for the real news. You know, I still talk to a lot of them. And, you know, from the media side, right, being part of the struggle from a media side, big part of your responsibility is to not only kind of lift up the stories that are important, but to help people who live in a thoroughly capitalized culture to understand why it's important, why they should care and what it means for them. And so I would try to kind of explain to people why this union drive at Amazon or any union drive at Amazon is important because of what Amazon is as an entity. However big you think Amazon is, it's way bigger than that, right? It's not just e-commerce, right? It is it is international. It is cloud storage. It is surveillance technology sold to police departments and the government. Amazon is trying to essentially become a more thoroughly technologized and sophisticated version of the business tyrants of the Gilded Age that we've been talking about, including Pullman, right? Pullman was really kind of a proto-Bezos in a lot of ways. And Jeff Bezos is building his own little Pullman towns in places like California, where they're creating not only smart houses, but almost smart neighborhoods that are all connected through Amazon technology. So the reason I bring that up is because Pullman, he actually had a very like moralistic drive to make people good workers by like encouraging them all to live in this town and then policing them in weird ways, including the detail that always sticks out to me is there was a bar in the middle of Pullman town and it was a trap. If you were a worker and you went to that bar, they would report on you. You would get like a warning saying that you were acting unchristianly. And if you did it again, since Pullman owned the houses, they could kick you out. That's really what we're talking about, right? Is like the will to total domination is built into capitalism. Capitalists will never be able to stop themselves from it. There's never a point at which anything will ever be enough for the people at the top of the system or for the system itself. That is why it needs to be stopped. I'm just tracing something here. So the, the Pullman town, it's it's named after the guy. It's, he's got his own little special town for his workplace. And that's where this big strike popped off. And now in the present, we have the modern Pullman setting up his own little Pullman towns. Is that where the strike should pop off then? Like, is that the spark where the fire of the next general strike might be lit? I mean, it's a really, I mean, it's probably a question that we should all get together for a part two to discuss. But I guess I would say that I'm still firmly of the mind that the place where this fight really matters the most is at the point of production. Because by the time we're talking about the surveillance technologies that are in our houses, that are in our phones, that are in our computers, that are tracing our facial recognition bullshit like everywhere we walk, by then it's already too late, right? By then the system has already webbed itself out into the rest of society. Where that system is still dependent on the labor of flesh and blood human beings and where it can be disrupted by the withdrawal of labor of flesh and blood human beings is at the certain choke points without which its entire system breaks down. And so that includes places like the Amazon Fulfillment Center, which has over 6,000 workers. There are hardly any manufacturing plants in North America that are that big. Or it's the last mile kind of, not the fulfillment centers, not the sortation centers, but the delivery centers that's where the, the boxes go right before they get put on a truck and delivered to your door. If you shut those down, Amazon's one day delivery breaks down, right? And so that is currently where Amazon, I think, is most vulnerable. But the Pullman Town 2.0 that Amazon is kind of creating, because it's not just in these specific towns and places like California, it's everywhere. It's in every Alexa little bullshit box that people put in their kitchen. It's all the data that has already been sold. It is all the profiles that so many companies already have of you, even if you don't know what their names are, right? And so that's how far these tendrils are already going. And if we let it continue unchecked, Amazon's goal is to essentially turn the world into a Pullman town. Speaking of tendrils, I just found out during this conversation that Pullman loafs are named after this company, Pullman. So this entire loaf of bread is a derivative of that because apparently it's the most efficient type of bread. You can keep three Pullman loaves where you would have two round loaves. So he kept it and the railway cars were all stocked with this type of loaf, which we oh kind of God. think of as like sandwich bread loaf. 
they were all stocked with it. Now we call them Pullman loaves. So I wonder what we're going to call Amazon 100 years from now. It's like like maybe soda bottles will be like the Amazon bathroom or something. I don't know. One more Amazon thing that I, I just I, the they, they've got those wearables that there's the Amazon wearable without the screen. And one of the things that it does, if you let it, is listen to the tone of your voice over the day and then give you reports on how much you were angry, how much you were happy. You can get your sort of tone of voice and and how you were treating other people so you can be like, oh, I wasn't positive enough today. Well, what a great idea for a wearable, right? The consumer marketplace is working again. But imagine if, what if this is a Pullman trap? And what if this technology is not a bar for you to learn how to be a nicer person, but it's actually a bar to check your Christian values and to keep you outside of the workplace? Just just a thought that came to mind during these uh, troubling discussions about the, the, the Bezos uh, empire technological tendrils. Yeah, I mean, I would say they already, you know, the, their employees are already under the same conditions as like they would have been in the Pullman town. Like if they speak up, if they disagree like there's a forced happiness in like corporate culture right and like if you deviate from that like you'll just like basically lose your job and then you will also lose your housing because even though amazon doesn't own the housing other capitalists own the housing and so yeah in the pullman town it was like you went to the bar and then you got kicked out but it's like the same thing where it's like oh if you deviate from positive corporate culture, you will still lose your home, even if it's through like slightly different and less, slightly less centralized dynamics, which makes it almost like harder to fight it even. So this is the current Pullman Town 2.0 we're talking about. But the way that Pullman Town 1 ended up is that they go on strike. The major event that kind of initiates it is that the company lays off a bunch of workers, lowers wages, but also at the same time doesn't reduce rents. And the people in the city can't buy and own their own houses. Like the company owns all the houses in the city and sets all the rents. Sloppy. You got to get two guys to do that. Then you're good. So they go on strike. Another thing that's been happening at the same time is that in the last year, the American Railway Union was founded by Eugene Debs. The Pullman town, when a bunch of the workers there are going on strike, the American Railway Union goes to Pullman, Chicago and starts to organize them because they're not part of any union. And, you know, they're signing people up and things begin to escalate. Pullman doesn't want to recognize the American Railway Union as representing the workers. And so together, the American Railway Union, the Pullman workers, they organize a work stoppage. This work stoppage at its peak ends up including a quarter of a million railroad workers and more than half of the states in the country. Most of the railroads west of Detroit ended up shut down. There's a lot of opposition to this. Obviously, people want things to move on the railroad. The Railroad Brotherhoods and the American Federation of Labor were two major groups involved at the time that were opposed to the boycott. It's a connection, the organization, the Federation of Labor was there opposed to it. Things continue to escalate. The president gets involved. He orders them to start allowing trains carrying mail through and the protesters refuse so grover cleveland sends in the military to stop the strikers from blocking the trains there is you know outbursts of conflict with authorities in multiple places along this situation in the end about 30 people are killed and the property damage was said to have totaled around $80 million. Eugene Debs is convicted in court of violating a court order. He's sent to prison. The ARU is disbanded. And four days after the strike is ended, Grover Cleveland signs into law that we're now going to have Labor Day on the first Monday of September. And it's going to be a celebration of labor rights. Because all the labor rights have already been won, right? Like everything you ask for, you have an eight-hour day. What what more could you want? Just slow down. Stop there. Just we're going to celebrate. Stop all this striking. Stop all this organizing. You know, forget about the dynamite and the assassinations and the, you know, direct action, radical labor movement. Let's just forget about all that and just job well done. We did it. Pat ourselves on the back. <laughs> no more organizing needed. 
Oh, yeah, and, and didn't they make May Day in the U.S. something like Loyalty Day or something like that, or Law Day? I think it's like 1960 that this happened. It's much later, but it's still like there's the international workers' movement being like, this is our day, and then uh, America signs into law. It's called Licking the Boot Day. And I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> well, before it was Licking the Boot Day, we have to talk about um, the other holiday that fell on May 1st for quite some time. So I read a pamphlet by somebody named Alex Transenberg, and he wrote this in 1932. So this was all kind of like happening while, like around the time he was writing it. But he was really angry at uh, our friends, the American Federation of Labor, because they decided to like collaborate with the U.S. government to instill Child Health Day on <laughs> May 1st. <laughs> so he writes here that like that he was very angry at them because of the hypocrisy of the AFL you know, caring about quote unquote children's health when millions of children have been forced to work in the mills and the shops and the fields for the glory of American capital. And literally in the 1928 convention of the AFL, they write about this. So like, this is the AFL speaking about this. They say, the communists still maintain May 1st is Labor Day. Hereafter, May 1st will be known as Child Health Day. <laughs> as the president is directed by the resolution passed in Congress to issue a proclamation calling upon the people of the United States to observe May 1 as Child Health Day. The object is to create a sentiment for year-round protection to the health of children. It is a most worthy purpose. At the same time, May 1st no longer will be known as either Strike Day or Communist Labor Day. It's over, folks. We're not doing that anymore. We're focused on child's health on May 1st now. Why, the so, two are so compatible, though. Like, it could be Child's Health Day and Labor Day and International Workers' Day. Like, who did more for children's health than the labor movement? Exactly. When they, like, ended child labor. Like, they're talking about children toiling in the fields and the factories. It's like, why do you think they don't do that anymore? It's because of the labor movement. <laughs> And perhaps like the strangest epilogue to this little historical detour is that Child Health Day, that's the thing that's also strange, it's just Child Health Day. There's not actually an S in the official name. So um, Child Health Day is now October 2nd because in 2017, Trump decided that it wasn't May 1st anymore. I can't find any reason why it was moved, but this is just like one of the strangest things that um, He's a man I've of the ever people. really come across. Yeah. <laughs> well, at least now we can go back to celebrating May Day as International Workers Day. Finally. <laughs> Thanks to Trump. <laughs> We've been waiting. Thank you, Donald Trump. <laughs> Trump made it so we no longer have to choose between our passion for children's health and our passion for the labor movement. It's, 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 it's truly a blessing. <laughs> I'm looking forward to our next panel on uh, October 2nd for Child Health Day. So <laughs> sign me up for that. It's funny, but I hadn't ever thought of it in these terms, but it really makes a lot of sense. After hearing what, what Liz, Amy, Franz, and, and Aaron were all saying about this really deeply political move to center the workers' holiday on Labor Day and not on May Day, right? I mean, for anyone listening, I mean, you may have seen people tweeting about this. You may have read an article about it recently, but it is part of history, right? It was a calculated move by the forces represented by folks like uh, Samuel Gompers, to shift the focus of the labor movement away from what they felt May Day represented and who it represented, the vision of society and the labor movement it represented, to this thing called Labor Day. And there's a really fascinating history there, too, because I believe that the concept of Labor Day was originated by someone who was spurned by the antecedent of the American Federation of Labor in the 1980s. It kind of fell into disrepair, and then it was revived by, by Gompers and others in the early 20th century. But there's something really key here that speaks to that bargain with the devil that Gompers, liberal, centrist, whatever we would call it at that time, but this belief that the fundamental antagonism between the ruling and the working classes could ever be resolved without conflict, right? That it could be resolved while maintaining the structure of hierarchy that ensures there will always be a ruling class and a massive dominated exploited working class. Like what sort of peace can you hope to have in a system that maintains that structure? People like Gompers were trying to create that reality through symbolic acts like Labor Day and through kind of 
a whole mess of cultural air conditioning that spoke to the ideology that is really embodied in Labor Day. And just like what I was saying that I hadn't thought about, but I, I realized after hearing you all talk, was that in a lot of ways, Labor Day, a century ago when it was really kind of inscribed as the new holiday of the workers' movement, it was kind of a, an antecedent to the end of history thesis, right? It's this backward-looking commemorative holiday of what the labor movement has achieved, whereas May Day has always been a forward-looking aspirational holiday of reaching for and striving for the world that we have not yet attained, remembering those in the past who died for this cause and whose legacy we carry on. But there is kind of that fundamental switch of backward-looking and forward-looking that you can see in this famous kind of piece that Samuel Gompers wrote about Labor Day in the New York Times a century ago. And if, if everyone's okay, I just wanted to read a couple of choice passages from this to really drive this home. But Gompers wrote, he starts it with, quote, Labor Day marks a new epoch in the annals of human history. It differs essentially from some of the other holidays of the year in that it glorifies no armed conflicts or battles of man's prowess over man. Parentheses, that is a direct challenge to the Marxist thesis that all of human history is the history of class conflict, right? So Gompers continues, Labor Day is the day conceded by no one class or set of people to another. It is the day of the workers, secured by the workers, for the workers, and for all. So again, he's he's really trying to both gesture to this is the workers' holiday, but this is all of our holiday. This is a celebration of how great our society is with a strong labor movement. Labor Day stands for industrial peace and for the toiler's economic, political, social, and moral advancement. Organized labor, in its essence, presents a rational, hence a peaceful, means for the production of normal, fair, and just conditions for all. There ought not to be, and in the near future will not be, conflicts other than those which are conducted normally, peacefully, and rightly. Oh, and then at the very end he says, Our labor movement has no system to crush. It has nothing to overturn. It purposes to build up to develop, to rejuvenate humanity, end quote. It's all there what Gompers is trying to signify with this movement of what, everything that May Day represented into this holiday, this kind of fake holiday of Labor Day, to celebrate this notion that working people are not at odds with the bosses and ruling class that exploits them. We just need to make sure that we have equal representation in the workplace and everything else is, will be gravy. To pick up on the end of history comparison, it's like the end of history of labor's development. And we're still sort of stuck there, right? We haven't done 80 or 90 years of like philosophical work of pushing the frontiers of what it means to be a laborer or a worker in society since then. We're still caught up in this sort of like this era of like, we're still fighting sort of to keep the eight hour day. Like there isn't the imagination for a six hour day or like a 32 hour week or a 20 hour week. Changing relationships to the workplace, to have a democratic workplace or distributing the power of workplace to workers is something that's been part and parcel of this whole thing for hundreds of years. Like people have talked about this for a long time. It's striking to me how much that strategy of appeasement and that devil's bargain, it worked well for a group of people who shut themselves out to the concerns of the world and helped themselves in a limited sense by like alliancing themselves with the unjust powers. The result of it, I feel like, is overall more akin to what Franz was saying at the, at the start of the show, which is that we've got a situation on the left where we haven't built, we don't have the power, like we don't, we don't have the preconditions of power. We don't have these massive movements anymore. And it really, it, it feels like that, that moment, Max, that you're talking about in, in this sort of split and the way that these powerful institutional parts of the labor movement threw the radical movement under the bus to alliance themselves with the system. It seems like that was a really, really big mistake that comes to haunt us every day. Just to go back to what you're saying of like, we haven't done the work to like really think about the working class right now. I just <laughs> wanted to bring up one of the tragic moments for me recently is Dolly Parton rewriting nine to five to be uh, five to nine. And um, on one hand, I think it's interesting that nine to five could never be written today because we all work 830 to seven or like 11 to like 1 a.m. or like just like we work like even, you know, quote unquote office hours. I used to work like 830 to six, like regularly. So for one, on one hand, it's like, yeah, 
there's it's just sad that we don't even we're not even fighting against the nine to five anymore. We're we're fighting against this thing where lunch break doesn't really count as part of your work day. So if you take a longer lunch, you have to just like stay for an indeterminate amount of time. And then to have sort of like this like really a horrible moment of it being like, oh now, but also now we're gig workers. So we're also working from five to nine. And it's like on top of all this stuff where I can see so clearly labor conditions getting worse for pretty much everyone. We also have people saying that like some workers do not deserve unions or shouldn't unionize or like, oh, like if you work for a tech company, you shouldn't unionize. Okay, well, like there are lots of tech workers that don't make a lot of money. They're just happen to be associated with a tech company, for example, or it's like, oh, if you work an office job of any kind, then you don't need that. Okay, that doesn't really make sense. Like we have <laughs> lots of history of like secretaries and stuff needing unions. Like basically every worker needs a union is what I should just end with. It is hard right now because part of the reason I think we're really struggling to have that labor movement is that so few people really feel comfortable actually saying, no, I'm a worker just because they have some other privileges or they have a job that's not like literally a coal mining job or they didn't work in a mill since they were five years old. It's like, well, hopefully no one worked in a mill since they were five years old so we can all be workers together. Come on, workers of the world unite. Like, I don't think we have anything to lose but our chains. Like, I don't know, just an idea. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good idea. Yeah, I was just gonna say like this era of like the Gilded Age and it's sort of like this golden age of US radicalism and radical labor struggles and labor movements. And those who hold power did everything they could to suppress that and prevent it from coming back and preventing that movement from achieving its goals, from like ending capitalism, from enacting total human emancipation and ending suffering and hierarchy and exploitation. And we see that from everything from the moving of Labor Day from this celebration and continuation of the radical labor movement to September and the defanging of it, even in Europe, where like Labor Day is still frequently celebrated on May 1st, like as early as 1897, anarcho-communist Erico Malatesta was complaining that like the European Social Democrats were ruining May Day by watering it down into um, what he called as an innocuous anniversary on the calendar for revolutionary merrymakers. Basically, sort of just this day to to celebrate and not really to to struggle or to try to actually enact revolutionary activity. I think another example of like the co-optation of this is like in the Soviet Union and other Soviet aligned countries, the way that May Day be kind of became this day to do military parades and to celebrate the military strength of these countries, despite May Day's and International Workers Day's origins in this sort of like anti-war sentiment. And then, you know, what eventually kind of turns like shifts from the Gilded Age of Capitalism to the Social Democratic Age of Capitalism in the US, you know, with Keynesianism and the New Deal and this like post World War II like welfare state that arises. It's it's really this compromise between the working class and the ruling class who realizes that they can't continue just like pushing like at the hardest they can. They can't maintain this level of exploitation without the pressure boiling over, without the pressure cooker exploding, and the radical labor movement becoming too powerful. But like now we exist in this like neoliberal era of capitalism, right? Which I think in a lot of ways, like we can look back at the Gilded Age of capitalism and see all these connections. We can also, you know, see clearly lots of differences, especially in terms of like technology and gig labor economy and the precarious nature of the working class as it exists today. But I think we are sort of looking at this like cycle coming back around in, in the modern era over the last like few decades to the point where the most powerful capitalists are are really able to go unchecked are really able to intensify the degree of exploitation and the degree of control they have over working and poor people all over the world. And so I think like looking back at these past struggles and the ways that they were either crushed or dismantled or dissipated, but also the ways in which they started and how they like what conditions specifically they were responding to, like looking at that history, we should be like applying those lessons to today and saying like, what are the similarities between our current moment and this Gilded Age of capitalism? What are the differences? Like, what are the particularities of our current moment that we should be focusing on? Um, and what should May Day become? Like, how can we move past this history of co-optation and watering down 
and shifting of dates and look forward into like, what should May Day be? Like in the year 2021, what does it mean to reclaim like the radical history of May Day and use it as a jumping off point to bring back the radical movement? Like to bring back an organized left and organized social movements fighting for the same goals that they were fighting for back then, you know, less work, uh, more freedom, less exploitation, and so on. I don't know, like, I don't know what May Day should be today, but I, I think, like, we should be looking forward and trying to make it more than, like, what it's become and more than, like, even, like, the most radical, like, May Day events put on by anarchists or socialists or, or labor activists in the last few years, it always kind of seems to boil down to pretty, like, symbolic marches or maybe even sort of, like, symbolic riots where a couple windows are smashed or sort of these vague calls for a general strike without any of the actual organizing that goes into making a strike possible. And so it really feels like there's kind of been this this watering down and ritualization of May Day that's disconnected from any sort of actual like movement building, movement education, fighting for specific demands and winning concessions from the ruling class. So I, I think like trying to bring back that radical history is something we should be doing today. One add on I had to that was that just when I was looking at the history of how May Day events have ebbed and flowed in Canada since its inception, and I assume this is similar in the United States and like other places as well, there's been activity on May Day throughout all these years, but the amount of activity and the types of activity and like the amount of people showing up to events and the extent to which those events are tied to actual demands or whether they're more of just a, hey, labor still exists and like a few people are showing up to have a little mini parade or whatever really depends on what's actually going on in history at that point in time. So you see a lot more May Day activity in the 30s than you do in like the 1990s, for example. There's other swell ups in like the 60s and 70s and stuff. But then it really does also seem like there's been a lot more activity as of late and not in terms of a whole lot of specific demands, unfortunately, but just in terms of like regular May Day events that are relatively well attended existing. So it just occurs to me that the opportunity to celebrate around this time of year has existed for a really long time. And the tie between that and workers has existed for a big part of like labor history. So it's just, it's a real opportunity to use this day for the current struggles that we face. And I pulled this quote, a lot of the May Day activity in Canada tends to center around Montreal. I mentioned them as like the first major May Day events, and you can find a lot of recent May Day events in Montreal. And I just was reading reporting done on them in this like student newspaper from McGill that you can find online that have like rundowns of like how the cops kettled the protesters and how many people were arrested in various years, stuff like that. But then also like reporting on what the people at the protests said. And this quote from one of the uh, organizers who was speaking at the 2017 Montreal protest to me just really seemed like it summed up what May Day has always been about and what current workers struggles need to be about in the modern day. But it says, today, immigrant workers are not only just fighting for their dignity, but they're fighting against an entire system that pins them with the greatest burden and social cost for capital's interest and continued profit and for the continued destruction of this planet. Tying together that sort of like international worker heritage of May Day to the ways in which immigrant labor today is facing the biggest brunt of climate change, which is like one of the biggest problems facing the planet, facing workers today. It really just seemed like that's the core around what labor needs to be focused on right now is like international solidarity and like unity against capital's interest in continuing the profits and destruction of the planet. 
building off of what Franz and Aaron were saying, that's really what I'm sitting and thinking with right now. You know, obviously one of the major lessons of May Day is is that internationalism, right? And and in a way I think it's because it circles all the way back to what we started to talk about, right? We were talking about the connection between human beings and the world that they live in, the societies that they're a part of, right? And how capitalist modernity has ruined so many people, so many bodies, so many nations, so much of the planet to maintain this fiction of life on an island, right? A, a palatial island where you can be, you know, an island unto yourself and not have to worry about the rest of the world, right? You can buy yourself this fictive reality of living in an oasis where you get to be unconnected from the rest of the world. We are seeing how that was always a fiction. That was always a fantasy, right? Uh, we mentioned climate change. This is the chickens coming home to roost of that same capitalist system creating the sorts of conditions in the natural world that we can no longer escape, right? We are part of that world. We always were. Capitalism just made us forget that for a while. Climate change will never let us forget it. Right. And by then it may be too late when we finally learn that lesson. But even beyond that, right now we are watching horrors unfold in the global south in places like India that are struggling to vaccinate their populations, both because of fascist shitheads like Modi and because of the hoarding of resources and patents uh, in the global north. Right. We are seeing how even today, like always, we can get suckered into this notion that what's good for us is enough, right? And that it's not going to ever come back to bite us in the ass, that it's never going to have ripple effects uh, that cause so much human misery throughout the world. That has never been the case. It was not the case. It's not the case now. It wasn't the case in the times that we're talking about. Sean, you mentioned how the Second International, which at the time was supposed to be the standard bearer for the spirit of internationalism, crashed against the reality of World War I and they reverted to national chauvinism. They fell back on this kind of fictive reality that actually the place that we need to focus on is our own nation, right? Our own people, right? Not international solidarity. That's too hard. That's too much. And I mean, in many ways, that's how the communists kind of grew out. Lenin was there. There's a famous anecdote that after the German SPD voted in favor of war credits, Lenin read the news line and famously said, I'm no longer a social democrat. Now I'm a communist. Right. And the communists then arose. The Bolsheviks arose as the new standard bearer for internationalism. Gompers himself. Right. I wrote a dissertation on kind of Mexican communists and, and anarchists at this time. The Mexican radicals fucking hated Gompers. Right. Not only because he represented the business unionism that would have Mexican workers make the same deal with the government that the American Federation of Labor did during wartime. But they also saw the AFL as a kind of arm of American imperialism, which it was. It was a way of extending American labor's influence into the labor movement in South America as a way to inoculate workers from the allure of communism, right? They knew what they were doing. But I say all this to say that whether it is nationhood, whether it is like the racist kind of notion of a homegrown, uh, more deserving working class, which the AFL was like committed to, that posed itself against these kind of not only radicals, but racialized radicals, immigrant radicals. We talked about this in the Winnipeg general strike, or that dynamic was playing out as well. You know, Canadians were coming home from the war. There was all this kind of punching sideways and down about the immigrants who were taking our jobs, the natives who were taking our jobs, yada, yada. What I hope is coming through here is that in the history that we've been telling and discussing, and it's been honestly a joy to be part of this conversation with all of you, we see all the different pitfalls that workers and, and well-meaning people have fallen into that have broken and shattered the spirit of internationalism. That is our only way out, right? It, it, the only way to tackle a system that has dominance over the globe and whose destruction has global implications that we are going to be living with for the rest of our lives is global solidarity, is working class solidarity across nations, across races, and making that mean something, right? Not just saying we're with you, but recognizing the different dynamics that play out. We in the North America, we're in the heart of empire here. We have a duty, right, to use that position 
to leverage whatever political power we can to build whatever political power we can to help our comrades in other parts of the country. And so I think carrying for me, carrying the spirit of internationalism on today in this year, after all the shit we've been through over the past year, after all that COVID has done to remind us that if you think you can inoculate yourself in one country and get rid of this disease, if you if you leave the rest of the fucking world out in the cold, then you're just going to be you're going to be vaccinating yourself every fucking year like we do with the flu. Right. We had a chance to eradicate this thing and we fucking blew it because we didn't realize how fundamentally interconnected we are. And the sooner that we do, the better chance we'll have at saving this fucking planet and building the world that we deserve. Here, here. A couple of thoughts connecting like Prince is asking, like, what should we do this May Day? And then this interconnectedness, it's making me think about political education in like labor organizing and that, you know, we've talked about these sort of business aligned unions and things and that you can have more and less radical unions and that what we need is like radical unions and like radical a radical labor movement. And so just thinking about incorporating like history into like organizing and making sure that we're like bringing people because like organizing is very radicalizing, but it also is not like doesn't happen by accident, you know, so like bringing in some of this history and talking about the interconnectedness and internationalism into like present day labor organizing is so important to building those radical movements that can really like fight for big, you know, international scale changes that that we need. Threading some of this together and going back to the start, Lee Hunt's quote sticks with me. May Day is the union of the two best things in the world, the love of nature and the love of each other. And I think we're in a position now in history, and I don't want to be starry eyed about this or pretend that it's going to be easy, but we're in a situation in history where there's this growing class consciousness, this growing ecological consciousness. And like Aaron was saying, you know, you look at the May Day events over our lifetimes and you can see now, oh my God, the 1990s were a massively reactionary period where there was almost no political stuff happening. It's it's actually wild to see like the influence of conservative talk radio on the human psyche for those years until the advent of Web 2.0 in 2004. You can see all of the trends start changing once we actually get the opportunities to speak to each other over the internet and meet other people who think similarly to we do and share ideas, have conversations like this, not just uh, for broadcast, but in private, you know, that th there's something happening right now in the world of ideas and information and the connection to our history and people recognizing, uh, like Max said at the start of the show, that this is the history of us and that this is the history of our forebears and the struggles that we're facing now, the thoughts and debates we're having now have historical precedents that we can trace and we can see the follies and the ins and outs of all these things. And we can see cases where we didn't do enough or, or our forebears didn't do enough. And we made mistakes as groups by doing things like excluding different types of labor or excluding things as labor, like reproductive labor being excluded from the idea of what a worker is. And this notion of workers are these oil stained wrench overalls type guys and no one else and just the white ones. And, you know, like this sort of stuff, like where you're excluding people by metric of their race or their gender or where they're born in the world. And it makes me think also, again, to go back to the start, the two May Days, you got the spring May Day, which is coming out from a cold winter and going home again, being free again. And you've got the autumn May Day, which is reflecting on all you have built up and reflecting on all the work that is already done and being satisfied with where you are. There could be a type of May Day that still happens in spring that's based on being satisfied with where we are. And that type of autumn uh, spring synthesis needs to be cast out of our idea of what May Day should be. Because May Day, it's not about being like, oh, we all, we, we've got enough. It should always be about returning home after the cold winter and being able to be free again. And I think that's what in our, you know, deep in, in our history, like before we even had words for these things, that's what the May Festival meant to us. That's what spring meant to us, was going home, being free again. We can't say, oh, this is enough, either on an individual level or institutionally. We have to look back through all this history and we have to point out and notice when they didn't do enough. And we need to try to bring that knowledge in the present to make a movement that extends to, uh, as Fran said, universal human emancipation. And that is a bold and very, very hard thing to wrap your mind about everything that that would mean. But it means not shutting the door to anyone. And it means making sure that every voice matters. And it means that making sure that people, no matter their position in society, where they're born, the type of job they have, anything like this is used as a way to exclude people or divide us. And in particular, it's really important that people in 2014, when we launched Seriously Wrong, 
I, this was new to me. They have to check their privilege. They have to look at look at where you are in the system, what advantages you have, and then think of those advantages not as something as guilt or shame. You know, I'm not worker enough or something like that. Uh, friend, don't be ridiculous. But what do you have that you can share, and what what tools can you bring to the struggle? How can you help other people? How can you use your position if you have it to help the people who are outside of that position? And I think like that vibrant homegoing sort of freedom idea of May Day that is never enough and that there's going to be new frontiers and we're going to look back on the present. I'm going to look back on this recording and be like, I didn't do enough. I didn't get that right. And that's good. That's what May Day should be about, that eternally erupting forward. And I think especially in the time of coronavirus, we are currently in a time of very cold winter. And if we can make it this May Day, where we are free again, and I'm not talking about taking masks off. I'm talking about fighting for people together again, like we did before the pandemic. And I think a lot of people are still doing work, but it's been really, really hard. And it's been it's been really, really hard to keep it up through this really, really tough time. But I think if we can make May Day 2021 sort of an icon of that to ourselves, in that people who have withdrawn over the last time, who aren't doing the political work that makes them proud, that makes them feel like who they are. You know, we're all losing things from the pandemic. We're losing aspects of ourselves that we can't act out. And if we could make May Day the impetus for the rebirth of spring in a metaphorical sense as it comes to our own political activist lives, I think that this May Day will have been a roaring success. Yeah. yeah. Cheers to that. That's how I felt after Max finished talking, but I was I was the only one who was like, yeah, but I think it was too, it's just too awkward. But since I broke the uh, I broke the seal on the previous one, anyways, I don't know, overthinking well, it's, it. It's it's hard with the podcast vibe. You don't want to like talk over someone. I don't know. It's awkward, you know. Yeah. But I guess the audience can't see all the like affirmative hand gestures I've been doing the whole time. So. Yeah, we've done so many secret gestures just for us. Sorry, sorry, folks at home. Uh, yeah, lots of nodding, lots of yes, smiles, <laughs> silent laughs. Yes. Yeah. Well, this has been like really, really fun and exciting and like a really, really great conversation that was like an honor and a privilege to be a part of. And I'm so happy that, you know, all four of you were able to come on our show this time. This has been just been like an awesome conversation. And I feel like in this process and research and also talking to you, I've learned more about May Day and I've got a better sense of like, what May Day means to me. And I feel like if if that's what we brought to people today, then I'm extremely, extremely proud of what we just did together. Can I ask if folks want to share anything they're doing for May Day this year or, or a May Day <laughs> memory or like, I don't know. Actually, I think the only real May Day event I went to was maybe in 2017 or 2018. It's not from a lack of interest, it's a lack of real events happening. But there was this really big one in Vancouver. It was sort of like a street festival. And it was started by this mysterious Facebook account with an avatar of a raccoon, who I think was maybe like a friend of a friend or something. I don't know how I got connected to it, but it was so huge. And I was in the pirate party at the time. And this would be 2015 then. I was in the, and I was just handing out flyers how to encrypt your communications online to everyone. And like, that was my vibe for the day. I also talked to a police officer once, which I wouldn't do today, but I went up to him and I was like, hey man, do you know if you guys have the Stingray things? And he's like, what's that? And I was like, it's when they like, you get stuff from our phones and you can tell who we are and where we've been and stuff. And he's like, oh yeah, we have that. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I don't know if he actually knows that they had that. He didn't seem like a super knowledgeable guy, but that was my May Day story and experience. That's the, the only real May Day, visceral May Day experience I've got to have so far. Well, as I mentioned at the very beginning, in New York, there's always like the Union Square anarchists or socialists, like communist vibe. And one time we were there and there was like a like bigger group had been like, oh, anarchists, why don't you lead the march? And so we all start like marching in the street and then all the socialists are like, oh, we're going to march on the sidewalk. And Anyway, so we all get like squished on the sidewalk and we're like kind of kettled in. And then like a bunch of us went through this bank. So like a bank that had like, it was like an ATM that had a door on both sides of the corner of the street. Well, because there and, were cops there at this point. Because there were cops there. There was like a whole line of cops kind of like blocking it. And yeah. then so like to get out of the kettle, we like went through the ATM. Oh, that's amazing. Nice. <laughs> A pretty good time. That's just, I don't know. There were like bike cops. It's always like a shit show. Because also Union Square is like not very... And not like a strategically good location for like beginning a march because it's like, you know, well, also obviously the police all know you're going to show up there because it's May Day. So that's just like a fun, ridiculous May Day. 
And I think that was the year we did rainbow iridescent bandanas. I mean, obviously this would be before COVID, so masks weren't allowed because now that now they're mandatory, but there was a while where they weren't allowed. So um, we had these rainbow iridescent bandanas to sort of like signal that we were like masked up, but like in a friendly way. That did not seem to be transferred. The, the cops didn't seem to really pick up on that messaging. And I think a lot of people got arrested literally for just wearing masks. But I think my favorite May Day was we were at a different park and Food Not Bombs did a picnic kind of vibe. Like, so they did their regular Food Not Bombs thing, but then there was also like a potluck element and we all just sort of like hung out in Tompkins Square Park and like had like a really great bring vibe. And then Chelsea Man- Manning randomly showed up and everybody was like, oh my God, like it's a celebrity sighting. Like, I mean, for us, I, I don't know. I don't know if like other people think it's a celebrity sighting, but for us, it was like a big deal. She's a damn celebrity. <laughs> <hell yeah. laughs> Everybody's like, oh my God, did you see Chelsea Manning's at her picnic? Oh my God. <laughs> Well, well, like I said, I mean, it, re- it really wasn't until recently that I connected with this history. And, and you know, I have learned about it through the work of everyone on this call and, and a lot of other friends and comrades out there. But I guess, yeah, to like just put a cherry on all of us, you know, being grateful for being here, thankful for being on this first panel and really just celebrating with uh, with Sean and Aaron for seven years of incredible work. Uh, I do have a memory from around this time of year three years ago you know i was in grad school at the time and i was a night owl uh so i would be working until like four in the morning most nights um and or i guess i'd be working till like two and then i would get really high and then i would walk to the Seven Eleven down the street get like some hot cheetos some you know some goodies and come back and watch some stupid shit so i distinctly remember someone saying hey you should check out this show and I was like, no, nah, it looks stupid. <laughs> I don't want to watch it. <laughs> I don't want to listen to it. But I threw it on because I there was a, an episode on clout that they were like, you got to check this out because it seems like it'd be right up your alley. And so I had my headphones on. I was really high. I was kind of walking my way in like the, the warm Ann Arbor night towards a 7-Eleven at 2 in the morning. And the keyboard warrior sketch between Aaron and Sean comes on. And I just started – I bowled over cracking up on the sidewalk like i was la- i was laughing so hard at it because it just it spoke so well to like you know how i wish i could kind of make fun of that that genre of people and that genre of argument and i don't know it's just it always felt like in the conversations that you guys had i mean they're honest they're open they're genuine they're caring and in a lot of ways, it, it, I feel like Seriously Wrong has always given me, again, not just a, a, a really joyful kind of podcast experience, which is not, that doesn't happen very often, um, but also one that challenges me, one that, that I always feel like I'm learning in, but also one that, I, that made me feel like Aaron and Sean spoke what was in my heart but didn't have the words to say. And that's true for the episodes with just them. It's true for me knowing Franz without knowing who Franz was before, <laughs> right? I, I found out about Rebel Steps through Seriously Wrong, right? So, I mean, I'm genuinely grateful to you guys for all the work that you've done, everyone on this call. And I'm yeah, I'm, that, that does give me hope that we can use kind of media like this and conversations like these to actually build better friendships and remind ourselves why this life is worth living. So thank you. Awesome. Well, yeah. that's, that's really, it's really meaningful to me. That's really touching. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. And um, it's funny, a lot, of the, a lot of the seriously wrong stories start with, so I'm high on this drug and I'm, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had that once with someone telling us about the tubes and sorting and they were on, sh- they listened to the tubes and sorting episode on shrooms and they said that it made a lot of sense. Uh, <laughs> This has been a wonderful panel. Everybody listening to our show should check out the Rebel Steps podcast, the Doomer v. Bloomer podcast, the Working People podcast, because there is a whole lot more of all of these panelists producing really like wonderful content that has a lot of great information and ideas in it, much like today's panel did. So I just, yeah, I wanted to throw out another shout out to all the guests and their respective podcasts. And Max, you're also with the Real News Network now. I'm so proud of you, man. I watched the Real News Network in 2012 when fucking Occupy was going on and stuff. I was like, finally, real news. (laughs) (laughs) Finally, news that's real. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, it's in the name. Right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, it's it's wild, man. Yeah. You know, I, I took the editor in chief job in October. I was not looking to jump careers uh, in the middle of a pandemic, but it just it, it kind of happened. But um, yeah, I mean, Real News has a great, long, proud tradition started in Canada, you know, moved down here to Baltimore. Um, I think that we're very much in a new phase of it, but we've got a great team. Like I said, I was covering the Bessemer Union Drive. I get to work with people like Eddie Conway, Black Panther, uh, who was a political prisoner for 44 years, and now he hosts a show where he talks to the victims of mass incarceration. I get to work with Lisa Snowden McRae, Jessel Noor, Mark Steiner, l radio legend, Stephen Janis, Taya Grams. It's really, yeah, it, it, it kind of have to pinch myself every now and then to remind myself where I am, but um, it's cool. Check us out. That is really cool. So we'll have links in the description for all the podcasts and all the news networks and <laughs> related to today's episode. Well, thanks everyone for listening and have a have a happy International Workers Day. Have a happy May Day. Hey, if you haven't rented your tightrope walking elephant yet, get on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tough booking. Yeah, get it in now. <laughs> and everyone wants them on May Day. <laughs> happy May Day, everybody. We'll see happy you at May the Day. Maypole, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Woo! <laughs> I'm wrong, you're wrong, he's wrong, she's wrong, they're wrong, we're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, I am wrong, we are wrong.